Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Renee Robinson. I am the Film Commissioner of Jamaica and the head of the Film Animation and Music Unit here at JAMPRO. And today we are going to be talking about economic impact data for the creative economy. So if you are a data nerd like me, or if you want to learn more about the true economic value of the work that the creative economy is, is contributing to the country, then you are in the right place. Before we start, uh, we have some housekeeping rules. So I will walk you through those. Um, the first one is that this event is being recorded. So if you are here, you are conceding to being recorded. Um, all video and audio have been turned off for all participants, except for the ones we're going to be speaking. And so because of that, we're asking that if you have questions, and we do encourage questions, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. So just to clarify, there's a difference between the chat function and the Q&A box. We're asking you to put your questions in the Q&A box so that the panelists can address them. Um, if you would prefer to verbalize your questions, you can also use the raise hand icon, which is it should be at the on the bottom bar there as well. So you can use the raise bar raise hand icon and the tech team will allow you to enable the microphone once that has been allowed from the from the panelists and the hosts. So those are the options. And again, we're definitely encouraging questions. Um, we look forward to, to a lively discussion. I know people might not think that data is lively, but data in this case is extremely lively and extremely important, especially because it's an area of where we have experienced quite a bit of a gap in the creative economy is having data around the action, the functionality and the economic contribution for the economy. So I am pleased that we're going to be speaking about that today. And joining me on this webinar is the team from A to Z, um, led by Dr. Noel Watson with Denise Watson and Miranda Albrook. And I'll just tell you a little bit about A to Z. Um, it is the, A to Z is the company, it's a, a research and a knowledge management company consultants. They have successfully worked with numerous local, regional and international organizations on projects ranging from research assignments for private company to advising the government, such as what they have done with us um, on trade agreements and various countries across the world. The company engages the services of more than 110 associates in projects that span several areas of expertise. Um, they are equipped with leading operational backgrounds and abundance of experience, are trained in the use of a practical approach to deliver sustainable performance, and the company's work continues to be underpinned by its commitment to delivery for functional solutions to every client. Now, as a client myself, I have to say that we were very pleased to be able to invite um, A to Z Consulting and Dr. Watson and his team to participate on this study with JAMPRO. Um, which was conducted, we, we, was several years in the making, um, but we are finally ready to, to review the results and to look through them. And then I also want to acknowledge as well, of course, the, the full team at Jamper that has supported this process, whether it's our research team and our marketing team, our policy team, everyone who's been involved in it, as well as our stakeholders externally. We also had some, um, some thank yous and acknowledgements with the various stakeholder partners, including the JBD the PIOJ, our Ministries of Culture, Ministry of Industry, and we also had some participation as well from an international consultancy, uh, Nordicity out of Canada. So we were very lucky to have a lot of experts and knowledge leaders participate in this, and um, thankfully it was all led by A to C Consulting. So Dr. Watson, I'm going to hand over to you and um, yeah, take it from there. Thank you. And thank you and, and welcome. Thank you for, for being here to do this presentation with us. Thank you very much, Renee. Um, you know, I nearly didn't recognize our company when you were describing it. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I'm going to, I have with me today my two colleagues. Well, I'm Noel. 
the CEO, as you just said, uh, ready to see you. With me is Denise um, over there. Denise is actually my wife. We have a family business and we have Miranda, um, who's my niece. We have, our company is built around eight family members that are all over the world. And um, we, we, you know, so we're always very pleased um, that we can work as a family and, and um, work with the Jamco family on this particular project too. Um, I just want to say that when this project came up, and can I share a screen, please? I'll just go ahead and share. Okay, when this project came up, um, Miranda Denise and I said, oh, let's put a proposal in. And, you know, as usual, you, you know, as researchers, you put a proposal in, sometimes a little bit rushed. And then once we got involved, I'm going to tell you, we said, oh, my God, as Renee said, this thing was years in coming. Um, and, you know, it reminded me of a song um, that I, I used to love years ago. Um, where a guy, and, I, and I'm, I have to make a confession in front of my wife here. Um, she's not heard this before. Um, but I, but Denise, um, I fooled around and fell in love. Um, this is a song that was a big hit back when I was a boy. Um, and what has really happened is that we fooled around with this um, creative stuff. And I'm really in love with it, you know? Um, and, and, and Renee, that's one of the reasons why when we're having so many challenges, we, we kept going with it because, you know, it's so interesting and so important to Jamaica. So, you know, just bear in mind that we, if I get passionate here, please forgive me because as I said, I, I fooled around and fell in love. Um, I even have that song queued up in case um, anybody needs to hear it. So, yeah, so colleagues, um, everyone listening, the, 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 the objective of the study was to do an economic impact study on Jamaica's film, animation and music industries. Um, and we call those FAM for short, F for film, A for animation, M for music. So when you hear us talk about FAM, it's not some French word for female or anything like that. It's just um, film, animation, and music, okay? Um, so in the contents of what we're going to speak about today, I'm just going to introduce um, what we're doing first, then we're going to tell you about our data collection processes, um, the, the contribution of FAM to GDP I'll tell you about, we look at the value chain so that you'll get an idea of what's in film, you know, all the way along the value chain. What's in animation? What's in music? Um, you know, I didn't realize that there were so many elements in these um, creative sectors until this, um, I started falling in love with this um, sector. And then we're going to look um, at the economic impact. So um, don't worry about the words, um, because words just cannot describe the challenge um, that we had. Um, but we're glad to be here. So the presentation shows um, the results of the study, okay? And the key objectives of the study were one, to provide a comprehensive account of practitioners in the, F, in the FAM industries. You know, who's out there? What are they doing? And then to quantify their contribution to their industry. So if you're, what's, what are the film um, practitioners contributing to the film industry? Um, what are the uh, animation co um, practitioners contributing to their industry and what are the music um, practitioners contributing to their industry? Because first of all, we have to look at what they contribute to their industry and then we move to the next one, is look at quantify how the, the economic activity of film, animation and industry. So apart from contributing to their industry, what you're gonna find is that, um, you know, people involved with film, you have people that cook food for the, for the people that are working in the communities, you have people that make dresses, you have people that do a whole lot of things. So when you think of film, just don't think of film. It, you know, the impact goes all the way across the economy. And to be quite honest, many times those benefits are greater than the benefits themselves to the people who earn, for, earn or are involved in the film or even to the industry because, you know, it goes much wider. And so those are some of the things that we're going to pick up in the, in the study. Um, apart from examining previous studies and other secondary sources, our main objectives um, and our main approach, to be honest, was working with knowledgeable stakeholders to provide critical information. Now, what's amazing out, out, out there about these industries is that the common thing that you'll hear about these industries is that there's no data. And that is true. However, there are some people in the industry, if you speak to them, they could speak to you for the next year, nonstop, about how this thing started from here to there and every element of the industry. But it's in, in their heads and not necessarily down on paper. 
and the data goes along with it, that should go along with it, isn't there, which may be one of the reasons why, you know, we, we, the policymakers um, don't have enough data to even assist the industry more, industries more than they, they do. Um, we sought the knowledge of these knowledgeable stakeholders in disseminating our specially designed um, questionnaires um, to, to various niches out there, um, to their members, um, because um, they have memberships, the associations we work with have memberships and we work with them. And we collaborated with them to extract from the internet valuable information available on fam industries, especially in the music industry. And I'm going to tell you about that a little bit later. I mean, if you have ever, if anybody has ever interviewed people from the music industry and get them to tell answer a set of questions, please come and tell me how you did it. Um, because it's not easy. And I understand why. And we, we worked with these people to get their validation on the findings that emerged from our study. So I'm going to move to my next slide with my. Okay, and I just want to start off um, a little backwards. I'm going to tell you some recommendations um, just to, you know, to get your adrenaline flowing before I go into how we did this. So one of our recommendations that came out of this study based on all the information is to start up reggae parks and other parish facilities to foster local performances. We made this in a recommendation years ago in another study. What we are saying is this, we need, recommend, we need reggae parks in all of our parishes to, you know, to, to develop the reggae music in the parishes um, so that when you know, Jamaicans and tourists want to get reggae, you can go to Trelawney, go to St. Anne, go to Clarendon, and reggae is there. You know, and it's not just reggae, it's music in general. And, you need, you know, and there are a lot of young people out there that want to get into the business. Um, we need to give them a, a, a feeding ground out there. So we could collaborate with, with um, football clubs and other clubs that are there and let music be part of the whole thing. So that's one thing we really think we should do. We should provide training and development to upcoming artists. There, I mean, everywhere you go across Jamaica, I mean, when I, when I go around Jamaica, I have young guys coming up and singing to me and saying, boss, you like my music, you can't make me, help me to boss, and that kind of thing. Um, there are a lot of talents out there, but, but it's, you know, we need to provide proper training and development to upcoming artists. Because really what we want to make Jamaica is a mecca um, for music. Um, all the way through at all levels that when you know in Jamaica it's just seeping through our systems when people come here they, it's just seeping through their systems we need to take advantage of that opportunity that we have which we've created for ourselves we need to dialogue no more dialogue between fam practitioners and the government to enhance trust we found that there was a, a lack of trust between the industry and the government they feel that if the government is is talking to them it's because they're after pursuing the, you know their money so as a result they become very secretive and they don't want to tell that's why they don't want to talk to us by the way because i think well when it is a gets the information we're going to go back to the government and the government's going to come running for them instead of thinking that when the a to z gets the information that policies may be put in place that will help them grow you know but understandably they have they, they you know i can understand why they feel um uh, trust um disconnect so we need to work on that because it's a it's wasting valuable um, um, resources and opportunities for Jamaica, while other countries are taking advantage of what we are creating here and making money out of it, and we are here with mistrust, not doing anything with it. We want to, we think we need to maintain a current data on fam industries. So Renee, we need to be encouraged to, to, you know, to get data current on it. So, so, you know, we don't want to wait another 10 years before another study comes up to get the data, and then we have to start all over again. We need to foster and reward creativity and do not tax creativity. And what are we saying there? I think something that we need to do or consider is actually making Jamaica um, a creative tax free zone or a creative low tax zone so that our creatives will want to stay here or return rather than run to America and, or other places because of the mistrust but they can come back knowing that they're not going to be taxed um, heavily. And not only will it encourage our Jamaicans, it will encourage foreign creatives to come here. So when, when those foreign creatives come here, um, it's going to be like a bit like those remote um, programs that Barbados and other countries have taken advantage um, and are doing very, very well during COVID, where creatives will come here, they'll write, they'll do their songs, they'll do their poetry. They'll stay in our villas, they'll stay in our hotels, they'll stay in our Airbnbs, 
and Jamaica will be that true creative center. Now, some people say to me, ah, oh, but you know, creatives need to pay their taxes like everybody else. And, and, and this is what I heard when I said it to a minister once. Yes, they need to pay their taxes, but the fact is if they're not paying it by staying away or moving their money abroad, you're not getting it anyway. And what I honestly think here is creative, everybody has creative potential. And so it, I don't believe it should be taxed for anybody. So let's take the Minister of Finance. If he comes up with a creative idea, um, I don't think he should be taxed either, right? Um, and the other day in his budget speech, I heard him singing a song, you know, I said, you know, me tell you, sir, me did tell you, and he sang it and the whole of parliament was entertained. Everybody was laughing. Um, that's good. He can be creative. And I'll tell you, we have a thing in Jamaica every year, colleagues, we are called powerful Jamaicans where they entertain us. And I'm not kidding you. There are some of those people are much more talented, in my opinion, in their singing, their creative, their dancing, than in actually what they are out there, their, 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 their main profession, even though they're good at that too. So I, I think that they should go for that. We should be encouraged to go for that. And they shouldn't be taxed on it. Right, so I think creative, everybody's creativity should be, should be, you know, encouraged, whether it's those people that are in it full time or other people, because then you stimulate it. Um, so I, I really, really think that's something that Jamaica needs to look at and, and encourage the creatives to stay and develop the industry more. We need to increase local consumption, given that local residents will be able to participate. Now, this recommendation is basically stemming from the fact that a lot of our artists choose to perform overseas. A lot of our people, if you look right now, you, you know, uh, well, I won't say right now, but in 2019, there were Jamaican people performing all over Germany, all over the world, all the time, not here in Jamaica. Um, but what we have to realize is when there's a performance in Jamaica, that is when local consumption kicks in because local people start to spend, the hairdressers are in business, the tailors are in business, the local car rental services are in business. The villas are in business. I mean, you, could, you just have to look back to the Bujabantan concert some time ago. You couldn't get a rental car in Jamaica. You could hardly find anywhere to, to, to stay. The food people on the street were selling. Um, if you understand the multiplier effects, that is when Jamaica really benefits from our creatives, when it goes well beyond the creative people to all, of, all Jamaicans that can participate. But if our performers are performing overseas, you know where those benefits go? They go to Germany. They go to the countries in which they're performing. And worse than that, when, the, when they make their money over in Germany, they say, boy, I don't want to carry it back to Jamaica because the tax man is going to say. So we don't even get the benefit of that, right? So we really need to re invert a lot of what we're doing. Let local people come to the, our performance. And when Jamaica is that mecca that I discussed earlier, where our performers are performing locally, then the tourists will come here to watch us rather than, you know, we go there so that they can watch us and we'll earn the dollars. You know, the, the only problem is will we be able to deal with it? But I'm sure we can find a way to deal with it. So we need to increase local consumption because it goes beyond that, it's pay school fees. You know, I will just say that a lot of times in, you know, in our communities, they're underdeveloped because the government doesn't have the money um, to develop some of our communities. Well, what we need to do is let our creatives put more money into those communities and develop it from within and don't have to depend upon the government, okay? That's how we have to do it. Okay, I move on to custom duty exemptions and waivers on imported equipment. That's important. What we're finding is that some of our creators are saying um, they're not accessing this. We need to look at that. Um, we also need to encourage foreign artists and other creators to come to Jamaica, which will provide opportunities, collaboration, um, where beneficial, as well as provide multiplier effects in terms of spending on accommodation, transportation, um, and um, and transportation and local and other local expenditure. So we really need to encourage foreign artists and other creatives to come to Jamaica, right? So that when they come and perform here, we make some more money from from that here, and they work with our people, and um, it's a it's a win win. So I just want to start with those recommendations just to stimulate you um, and get you thinking. So now um, moving into the next slide to look at um, um, the data collection process. 
So having said all of the above, we had to collect the data to do this study. And at first we thought it was easy. So we designed our, specially, um, our special collection, data collection instruments using Google Forms. Miranda did a great job. They were sent out to practitioners on behalf of us, on, our, on behalf of our team. Um, and um, unfortunately, industry associations weren't able to share their membership list with us because of confidentiality purpose. So we had to depend upon them to send it out. Um, so we couldn't follow up. Um, we were also able to dispatch data collection instruments to practitioners who we knew personally. So, you know, we know a few people, so we sent it out to them and they sent it out to their friends. Um, Jampro had a list and we used those. Um, Jampro also advertised a survey and made the links available on its website. And Jan, um, which is a Jamaica anima anima Animation National Network, they hosted Instagram live events and other events to get their members involved. The president went through the process of completing the questionnaires with the members and posted the link in a chat window for animators to complete. We were really, really, really thankful for that effort. And you see, when the associations work with the consultants, it's better for everyone. General limitations that we found in, you know, you know there's a, there is a dearth of information. There isn't a lot of information out there on the sector. Um, and in many cases, there's no baseline um, data out there. So there, a study that was done before um, had no baseline data to compare whether it was, whether it was um, effective or whether things had changed after, and, and it's similar for us. Many practitioners in, in the fam industries, especially in music, you know, they, they chose to be somewhat informal um, with respect to their operations in order to minimize the extent to which they have to divulge information about their businesses. So they stay informal, they don't register because they don't want anybody, they want to stay under the radar. I mean, apart from the fact that this means that they cannot collect some of their royalties, it means also that you can't find them and they won't speak to you. And we have to change that. We have to change the thing, the, the, the whole order so that our artists are proud to stand up and say, I made $15 million from my trade last year. You know, just like LeBron James can stand up in America and say, you know, is, what he earns is not a secret. Um, we need our artists to, be, to be feel free to say that um, and free to tell us what we earn so that we can help others. Right, and we can use it as an example for others. Um, now, here we factors that explain the lower than expected response rate. Well, I've just mentioned them. There was a level of suspicion, mistrust. There was a high level of apathy. Apathy, sorry, um, that they felt um, that they've done surveys before and nothing happened. Look how many times people come to me and we don't see nothing, Mr. Watson. Um, some are tired. Boy, we're just tired. Survey fatigue. Too much questionnaires. Everybody calling us, especially in COVID. Everybody sending us a question every day. Um, the fact that the consultants, that we didn't have access to the contact information of most of the practitioners meant that it was difficult. We couldn't follow up by phone. And that's a major thing, a technique that we use. The follow up by phone is usually a thing that yields a lot of results. Also, potential re responses couldn't see a direct benefit to them. And hence, they didn't make the completion of the survey a priority. You know? So those are some of the problems that we had. OK, so in our surveys, Fortunately, after all that effort, we had got 100 respondents. And trust me, that's good. 55 of them came from film, 23 came from animation, 22 from music. Now, this music is highlighted because 22 is not enough to say enough about the music industry. So we'll tell you later on how we got around that. And, that, and I think that's one of the most innovative things in the studies that we got around that. Now, just to say, quick facts that, that came out of our study. Um, the film industry is estimated to have um, um, overall impact of about 1.33% of GDP, which is significant. Animation, which is relatively new and young and growing, is just under 1% um, of GDP at 0.08. And the music industry, um, we've estimated to be 4.68% of GDP. Now, that's quite significant. And you know, it's possible that it could be more than that, but we, you know, we wanted to be conservative in our estimates. Um, now, what is interesting is if those industries together um, come to six point, um, about 6.2%, mining and quarrying, which is, um, you know, it's so big and everybody hears about mining and quarrying box, only contributes 1.8% of GDP. Electricity and water supply only contributes 2.9% of GDP. Hotels and restaurants, and they have a, they have a ministry all to themselves, contribute only to 4.0% of GDP. I'm, I actually was wondering, what if FAM had a ministry all to itself? 
man. Um, so estimated economic impact of Jamaica's FAM industries overall, uh, in terms of their contribution, um, we estimated that in Jamaican dollars, that the animation industry contributed about $1.7 billion, okay? Which is not trivial. The film industry contributed about $28 billion. And the music industry contributed about $98 billion. Now, all of this is against the GDP for the whole country of um, you know, $2 trillion. You know. And I'm gonna, in the next slide, we'll give you a little bit more um, insight into that. So, Dr. Watson, I, if I might ask you a quick question, if you could just, for the audience, um, give a quick overview of the definitions of economic impact. I know we've, we've talked about direct, indirect, and induced. So I think that that might be helpful for the audience to understand the, the context of the data. Thank you very much, um, Renee. Um, and I think it's somewhere later in the presentation, but I'll let, me, let me do it right here. Um, economic impact um, goes beyond just what, for example, the, uh, the musicians or the artists in music earn. So for example, an artist um, may earn a uh, million US dollars a year. However, in, in earning that million dollars a year, that artist has to buy equipment, has to pay producers, has to pay other staff members, has to buy Hennessy, has to do all the things that artists do. And so, 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 so th that means there is indirect um, expenditure or indirect impact as a result of what they do. So it's not just what they earn, there's indirect because they also spend in their industry, buying their music, et cetera, et cetera, and the things in the industry. But outside of that, there is what we call induced event effects. So the artist, as I just said, he, he or she will go out and spend um, money on clothes, spend money in their community, spend money on Hennessy, spend money on, on um, many, many things in, in the society, sending, you know, sending children to school. So the impact of what he earns induces, and that's why we call it induced, induces expenditure in all different parts of the economy. So, you know, sometimes you may not realize, you may not even realize, or she may not realize that their million dollars is actually being converted into like four or five million dollars worth of expenditure and economic activity elsewhere. Um, and economists call that multiplier effects, okay? And that's very, very important. Um, and that's why even as policymakers, um, Rene, we have to be always aware of um, the, 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 the economic impact and not just, boy, that, that musician's making a million dollars. What you have to realize that if you run him down and he doesn't make that million dollars and you lose it, um, and not only do we lose that, then we lose all the multiplier effects. All, I mean, and we can see this in terms of what happened in COVID recently. I mean, COVID basically shut down a lot of that, those industries. Um, and, you know, as a result of that, that shut down the earning of a lot of people in music, a lot of artists, you know, had to try and find other ways to make uh, money. And this is why, you know, we don't need to tax them um, as much as we think we do, because in an, a time like COVID, where they're not earning, they need to have some resources um, just to, to draw on. Also, you know, anything can happen to you. You can lose your voice, you can hurt yourself, and you may not be able to earn your income anymore. So they, you know, if they, they may earn money today, but they may not be earning tomorrow. So they, you know, we can't begrudge them what they're earning because, you know, it may not be always permanent. So you could have a short lifespan. So I hope everybody has got the idea of the economic impact now, it's, which is basically what, what, what an artist or a filmmaker or an animator does um, when, they, when they earn or contribute to GDP, the economic impact is much greater than just their earnings. And you can imagine when you add that up across all people in the film industry, all people in the animation industry, all people in the music industry, um, when you take their earnings um, and look at how that could ripple throughout the economy. 
then you start to know that that industry could have a major impact because it touches so many places from the nails to the hairstyles to the suits i mean if you ever go to some of those sessions and see the beauty of the attire and the amount of things that people eat you will realize that it's why it's important um, for these industries to always be active so thanks for asking that question so contribution of other economic sectors so if FAM contributes about 6.09% as we've estimated it. You know, as I said before, look at it against agriculture, look at it against mining, the, you know, agriculture 7%. Um, of course, wholesale and retail, we do a lot of that in Jamaica, that's big. FAM has a long way to go to catch that up. Um, but look, we're not even far behind transportation and storage, 6.5%. Financial services, big. Um, but as big as it is, you see our, our our creative industries is, is getting up there. And if we should make it grow, I fully believe that it could be bigger than financial services. Real estate and renting, you can see, um, it is not small compared to those. All right, so exports across farm industries. Now, somebody might want, might ask me, what about exports? You know, how, how does a musician expo export? How does a, an animator export? How does a filmmaker export? Well, the majority, 81, 81 out of the 100 respondents, indicate that their products were exported. And there is a significant amount um, of export to North American region. And overall, exports to the Caribbean are relatively small, um, indicated by 18% of respondents. And based on the findings to date, the most common mode of exporting by FAM practitioners is electronically over the internet or by courier. So let me just stop to tell you there. You don't realize, even in my business, when I send off a consultancy report to a client in um, Brussels, that is exporting. When a, when a musician um, sends, um, you know, by electronically, you know, some music or something, um, or a filmmaker sends, um, you know, some, some aspect of their filmmaking um, overseas, or an animator sends um, one of their, uh, their products overseas by internet or by a courier, that is exporting. And that is often shown up by, you know, earning for an exchange. But also export happens um, when people from overseas come here, like when the tourists come here and they actually consume our music and consume our products here. So you're actually exporting. So many of us are exporting and don't even know we're exporting. Um, I once said to a banker, um, you know, did you know that, um, that um, financial services are exported? And he hung up the phone. I mean, you don't know. After he told me, I didn't know what I was talking about. I, because a lot of us think that when you provide banking services locally, you're not ex exporting. But trust me, even financial services are exported. 11% um, of respondents across the FAM industries export to other regions in the world, um, with the majority coming from the film industry. The film industry, you know, exports to all over the place. You'd be surprised. Okay, um, I am I gonna take well, a little um, bit. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Watson, I think as well in that, just um, so to clarify as well for the audience that when we're thinking about export, it is export of services as well as export of goods. And that's the reason that I think many FAM practitioners don't necessarily consider themselves an exporter primarily because we, we are still in the process of shifting towards the, um, the mindset that what we are doing is in fact export of services. And, uh, you know, according to the WTO, there's four different modes of export um, of services. And we we actually are very closely aligned to that. So I really do want to encourage the practitioners who are watching this to explore some more information about export of services, because this is another way that you can demonstrate your economic impact. Thank you very much for that, Renee. And just before Denise, sorry, just before Miranda comes in, I will just say, Renee just mentioned the WTA having, WTO sorry, having four modes. And I'll just tell you what they are. The, four one, the first one is, um, what um, what I explained to you when you when you do it by courier um, um, or by internet, um, and that's where the service that the, the person who's providing the service actually doesn't leave where they are, but the service moves across a border, right? The next one is 
um, where the, the person who's consuming the service actually comes to Jamaica to consume. Um, so that's, they call that consumption of, um, abroad. So the foreigner actually comes here and consumes our music, our animation, sits down with one of our animators, our, our, our film people and do it, does it right here in Jamaica. The third one, mode three, is when you actually establish overseas a business. And more of us need to look at this, where you can actually set up overseas a business, take advantage of benefits. By the way, we have a, like a new economic partnership agreement with the United Kingdom, which means that for many of us, you can actually set up in the UK um, and take advantage of some of the benefits that you know, people over there can. So we need to explore those opportunities um, because trust me, the UK people will be exploring them here in Jamaica. And the fourth mode is, where, is what we call the movement of natural persons. And that is literally when an artist um, jumps on a plane, goes to Britain or goes to Germany and performs there. It's basically just the movement of the person to that other destination where they perform, um, earn their money, and then they come back home. But in all of those cases, you've exported your service because you've provided it to persons overseas. So that is the export of service, the four ways that you can do it. Okay, Denise, over to you and film. It's um, you, Miranda. Miranda. Sorry, Miranda. Sorry, Miranda. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry, Miranda. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of who participated in our survey from the film industry. Um, so, on our, in our survey, um, we had 55 respondents from film. 58% of them were female, and 42% were male. Um, and they came from all over, uh, all over Jamaica, but mainly from um, Kingston and St. Andrew. 84% of our respondents came from Kingston and St. Andrew. Um, then this was followed by St. James with 15%, then Clarendon, 10%, and St. Anne, 7%. So everyone else, 5.13% came from um, the other parishes. And of our respondents, 46% said that they'd worked in the film industry for more than 11 years. So that's just a, to give you an overview of who, who participated in our survey from the film industry. Um, Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so this is just to tell you about the film value chain. So there are four area, main areas in the film value chain, which is um, pre-production, um, production, post-production, post and exhibition, distribution, and marketing. Um, so 67% of our respondents were in the pre-production segment of the value chain. 76% um, were in the, in, the production, in the production segment. 58% were in the post-production segment and 27% operated in exhibition, distribution and marketing. So you can see from this that the most popular um, segment of the film value chain is the production segment. Um, and in the next slide, I'll tell you a bit more about who, who it, that entails. So in um, pre-production, we had 30 respondents who were producers or production assistants um, 26, 26 people were screenwriters, 22 were casting directors, 18 were scene or set designers, um, 15 people who responded were costume designers, and 14 were prop, prop managers. Um, let me just say, some people operated across different areas and did different roles in the survey. So we saw from our responses that people that kind of put on different hats in, in the film industry. So some of these people, were producers and screenwriters or producers and casting directors, for instance. So in production, which is our most popular um, segment, 31 people said they were producers or directors, 28 were camera crew, 23 people were location managers or cinematographers, 21 people were actors or makeup artists. So um, actors and 21 people were makeup artists. So that was um, the same number for two, those two sections. Um, six people were artistic directors or wardrobe um, stylists. So these are our most popular responses. So there were other people as well. Um, in post-production, we had 29 film editors, 21 graphic designers or artists, 17 recording and sound mixing experts. 13 people said that there were special effects specialists or music editors. We had 11 musicians, nine animators and eight illustrators. And in distribution, which was the least popular of the segments. 13 people said that they worked in marketing um, or administration. 11 people were accountants or PR staff. 10 people did poster designs. 
nine people were publicists and eight people were advertisers, four people were technical staff and three people were film sales agents. This just to give you an idea of who um, responded to our, our questionnaire and where people operated in their, in their um, organization across the film value chain. So can we go to the next slide, please? Sorry. So this just shows the main projects that practitioners in the film value chain um, operated in. So the most popular thing that people did, most popular activity um, is at commercials, where 71% of people who responded said they did commercials. Um, this was followed by social media and online content with 69% of people saying that they were involved in social media and online content. And then this was followed by documentaries. 62% of people said that they their firm did documentaries. Um, and this was followed by training or educational programs with 36% of, of people who responded saying that their firm did um, training and educational programs. So after this, we had music videos. Oh, sorry, no, wedding and video events, event videos, sorry, that was 27%. And then music videos was 24.5% of people did music videos. And then we had a tie with short films and feature length films, where 22% of people said that they did both of those. And the final um, area that people were involved in is serialized productions, um, where 7% of people said that they um, were involved in, in this area of the film value chain. So a quick yes. question for you, Miranda. Um, this just came up in the chat. I know we're going to do the majority of the questions later, but we did, this is quite actually relevant to what you're discussing right now is because we had discussed it. Um, what was the differentiation between persons who work as freelancers versus persons who are working in jobs employed to companies and how did that break down in the demographic? I have to look that up, sorry. Um, can we come back to that? Sorry to put you on the spot. We can definitely come back to it, but it was, it, I think it's quite relevant as you're breaking down the demographics of, of who participated and how they were, how they participated. And I remember it was something that we did speak about when we were designing it. So, and I just saw it in the chat. We can definitely come back to it. Definitely yeah, go, Matt. Thank you. Um, Denise, you want to come in now and talk, talk about animation yeah. in the meantime? Thank Good you. afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak about animation and the service size, the respondents. We had 23 respondents for animation, which was pretty small compared to the film. However, animation, as you know, it's a very young, relatively young industry. So that was not, you know, that was expected. Um, practitioners in this industry are said to be very cross-functional and multi-skilled. The smallest industry, it's the smallest industry, as I said before, based on the data gathered from the survey respondents. It is a male dominated, or it seemed to be a male dominated industry. We found that 78% of our respondents were male. The industry appears to be made up of younger practitioners with the majority, 40% of them between the ages of 21 and 30 and 39% between 21 and 40. Most, which is 87% of the respondents indicated that they have been working or operating in the industry for under 10 years. So it's a relatively young industry. And 82% of the respondents indicated that they operate mainly out of Kingston and St. Andrew. Next slide, please. Okay, in terms of the role of practitioners in the animation value chain, well, the animation value chain is pretty similar to the value chain of the film that Miranda just went through. But in terms of pre-production, we found that seven to 2% um, um, played a role of illustrators because this is the pre-production is where the, create, the creativity happens, where things are created. So 72% work as illustrators, 52% as um, the work on graphic, sorry, character set and prop design are prop character set and prop designers. 48% are storyboard art worked in the area of storyboard artistry. 48% are art, art creative directors and 38% anim animatics artists. 
and then 22% are visual effects editors. And as Miranda said, as in the film, we found that a lot of people could do a lot of things and people are very talented and operate across various roles within, the, within one segment of the value chain, as well as across different segments of the value chain. In terms of production, we found that 60% of the persons engaged as 2D animators, 40% um, engaged in roles of anim animation, animator directors, 40% 40, 40 3D animators, for another 40% digital painters, 40% character anim and 40% character animators, and 35% 3D modelers. And in the post production part of the value chain, 47% operated as filmed and video editors, 42% animation and effects editor, 37% animation directors another 37% um, also as sound effects editor, 32% and 26% um, post-production editors and sound designers respectively. So this, I mean, we were just interviewed 23 persons. So this tells you that persons were operating across the various value chain. Um, next, various segments of the value chain, sorry. In terms of the projects that the practice practitioners in the animation value chain in the, in the different segments of the, pro the projects that the people worked on, the 78% worked in digital animation, 35% in traditional animation, 35% were involved in social media and online content, and 35% were involved in commercials and YouTube videos. You know, those are very popular right now. In terms of website animation, there was 30% of the respondents were engaged in that. 26% um, were involved in computer generated in imagery, short films and visual effects. And 22% were involved in architectural previs, rendering, music videos and non-entertainment animation. And non-entertainment animation could be like training animation that you would use in training, like medical animation where, you know, you probably can use that to train doctors or to talk about um, something that may be happening health-wise in the country. So those are, those would be your non-entertainment non animation. Next slide. Okay, so Miranda. I'm gonna hand back to Miranda for the overview of the participation from the music value chain. Miranda, just before you come in, I just want to address Renee's question, one about freelancers versus um, companies. Um, yes, in our sample of film, out of the 55 um, respondents, we had 29 of them that were companies um, and 26 of them that were freelancers. However, speaking to the experts in the industry, they estimated that there were probably 50 companies about that were in the film industry, about 50. Um, and about 500 freelancers, okay? And those were important numbers for us because that is what we use later on to go from sample to population. Um, and some, some interesting things that you might want to know that the average, average size of projects that um, companies were involved in was about $3 million. So the average film company, were, you know, because remember these are people making videos and you know, they're not all making big blockbuster movies. They're, a lot of them are doing you know, relatively small things. The average um, is 3 million, whereas for freelancers, it's 1.25 million. So you can see that freelancers are a lot smaller. Um, so even though there are many more, they, they operate on smaller um, projects. Um, and um, the same thing, oh, by the way, um, freelancers tended to average about 12 projects per year, um, whereas companies who have more capacity tend to average 17 products per year. So you can see the companies did more and did larger ones. And obviously they have the capacity. Um, in animation, um, we got, um, you know, we had, we had five companies in our sample um, and 10 freelancers, sorry, 18 freelancers. And um, the, 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 it was estimated that there are about 20 companies in the industry. When we spoke to them, so they're um, there's about 20 animation companies in Jamaica is what they estimated. But 
but about, you know, the estimates of the number of practitioners um, went up to like, you know, anything up to a thousand because um, Jampro amongst other entities had programs where they were training animators. So we have a lot of trained animators across the country. Um, some of them are not practicing, but many of them are. So you get an idea there about um, freelancers versus um, companies. And, you know, the, the average value of project for companies in animation was about 10 million based upon the sample. Whereas for the freelancers, it's 250,000, um, you know, so they're doing small um, pieces of everything, but because there are many more of them, it come, you know, the freelancers contribute, contribution um, actually comes up um, to be quite large as well, you know, as in film, because there are many. Um, so I, I don't know if that gives you a little bit of the context that you're looking for, um, Renee. Um, and no, that's that's great. Absolutely. And I think it's very aligned because, I mean, even though the sample size for this particular research um, had its limitations, I think once we're actually expanding towards what that might look like in a, in a macro perspective, it is very aligned. Um, sort of anecdotal information that we've gotten from the industry associations, they would say, um, you know, that persons who are, you know, signed up and registered members of the industry associations, um, I think JAFTA is maybe around 200 or something like that, that's on their list of persons that they outreach to. So that does very much align. And with the animation companies that are registered, I saw a note in the chat from Adrian as well. So, you know, that estimate, I think, is very much aligned. I mean, even in the BOSS program, that happened with animation companies. There was 15 companies participating in this multi-year program. So obviously, you know, these would be the ones who were selected for this program, but there is a, a group, a cohort of, of companies that are outside of the ones who were selected for this program that were an, registered companies. And then yes, there have been thousands of individual persons who have been trained through the various training programs um, in animation. So yeah, very much aligned. Thank you. So yeah, please, um, please let's get back into the data. This is fascinating. Okay, and I think I'm doing sorry the music. Yes. Um, thank you for that, Noel, for um, answering that for me in a much more detailed way than I would have answered. Um, okay, so to look at the overview of participants from the music value chain, um, we had a quite a small survey size for this, um, 22 respondents. But as Noel said, we made up for this. Um, in a different way afterwards with the, our census um, method. But from our respondents, our survey respondents, we had 20, we had, sorry, it was a very male dominated um, list of respondents with three quarters of our respondents being male from the music industry. Um, we had representation from all 14 parishes. Most people once again came from Kingston and St. Andrew with 10 um, people saying they came from there. Um, 10 also operated in Westmoreland had operations in Westmoreland, but he said some people operated in more than one parish. So we had nine people who operated in St. James across our survey sample. Um, in terms of age range, the majority of our respondents were between 31 to 40 years of age, which is 54% of people in this age group. Um, and everyone else between 21 and 70 years of age were, um, 50, four, sorry, 46% of everyone else was um, in the other age ranges. 68% um, of our respondents had operate, have operated in the music industry for the last, ten, from over 10 years. Um, and 68% said that they were freelancers and 36% said that they were operated as a company. So that's just to give you an overview of, um, of who answered our, our sample, our survey from the music industry. Sorry. Okay, so across the music value chain, um, 11 people were musicians in pre-production, nine people were artists, four people were backup singers or music producers, and three people um, operated a, a record label company. In production, which is once again our most, um, seen as the most popular um, section of the value chain in music also, 12 people were musicians, 27 people were artists, Six people were backup singers or music producers, four people were music managers, two people were business managers or recording studio staff, and um, one person, sorry, is that one person? One person was recording studio staff. 
this looks like three people. So in terms of post-production, four music producers or mastering studio um, employees were, worked in post-production. Um, two people said they were music managers or media manufacturers or recording label um, music service providers. Um, and in exhibition, one person um, who responded, work, who worked at the exhibition um, was a music distributor or physical retailer, digital music um, distributor or video sharing services or podcast um, works in podcasts. So we had one person um, saying that they worked across those different sections in our responses. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, sorry. Okay. So these are the different roles of partitions in the music value chain. Um, I'll say most people were musicians with 12 um, people saying that they were musicians. Um, this is followed by artists or performers where 11 people said that they, 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 they were this. Um, then we had 10 backup singers, um, three promoters or organizers of festivals, two event promoters or organizers of shows, um, two event organizers or street, da or street dances, and three people said that they did live music or event streaming. Three people were music managers, um, two people were business managers and music, two people did music venue bookings and one person was a booking agent. So these are the main roles that, um, of people that responded to our questionnaire. Can we go to the next, next slide, please? Okay. So the main projects if, or partitioners in the music value chain um, we see that the live music sector and the production segment within the recording industry were the most active areas of the network of the music industry, music value chain, um, with 36% of people saying that they um, did DJ performances or, you know, like parties, events where they had DJs. 32% of people said they did live performances. So this covers the, um, the live music sector. And then we had 18 people who said, percent of people that said they did music production, 80% of people said they did they were musicians in a band, 9% um, of people did equipment rentals, 9% of people were hotel performers, 5% um, were live, did live recordings. And then the rest that were quite small, um, like 0.5% of people did studio rentals, merchandising, singing lessons, or like taught in the music industry. Um, and this is based on our 22 respondents. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's it for the music industry and who, um, who responded to our questionnaire. So I, wh why that, that, thanks Miranda, and thanks Denise so much. Um, Denise and Miranda were the ones out there um, struggling and getting all that information and know it so much better than, than I do. Um, so, you know, no, when they brought all this information to me, it was now, no, what am I gonna do with it? Um, the, the, the thing is, what, what we have just showed you, though, is, how, is the span of the industry. So many people, so many players in so many places across Jamaica. Um, so now we spoke about this a little earlier, about our um, approach to economic assessment, the economic impact. Now, in, in, in doing this, we, we looked at previous approaches. So, one of the main studies out there, one of the main companies out there that has done economic assessment is a company called Nordicity. They've done work in the UK, Canada, and other places, and have estimated the impact of various creative sectors on economies um, before. Um, I think Jamaica is not as easy as um, the UK or Canada because um, everybody has to be very formal in there. So they can use tax revenues, for example, to estimate a whole set of things on their industry, um, things that you, you can't even start doing here. Um, but the, the approach really had us to estimate the number of players in each of the family industries. So it was important. If you're going to do the impact, you've got to estimate how many people are there. Um, you've got to identify, um, you know, where the various players operate in their respective value chain. And then we had to estimate their direct contribution. And I mentioned this earlier through the collection and analysis of income and expenditure data within their industry. And then you have to estimate um, the economic impact through multipliers, et cetera. Um, now, one of the things that we would have hoped for, 
and a researcher hopes for is that your statistical institute or JAMPRO or PIOJR somewhere has this data and you can just pick it up. Um, no, and that's one of the reasons why JAMPRO asked us to do this study because they want to have the data so that the next person that comes along has something to base it on. Um, so, you know, we didn't have a lot of secondary data that could really help us, which is, which is unfortunate since there's so much out there. Um, so that was a um, thing, but that was the approach we we're going to take. How many people are there? Um, where are they? How much they, do they, do they um, earn or contribute to their industries? And how much does that expand to the general economy? So um, the, we mentioned some challenges. And for the data collection process using the online survey, we face uh, numerous challenges. Um, the film and animation, the results obtained from the online survey, um, because they were quite good, and Rene mentioned that they're quite representative, it will underpin the process of estimating the economic um, um, impact of, of film and animation. We're quite comfortable that the, da the data that we got from those industries, because the associations know their industries quite well, so they can actually triangulate or corroborate what we found them from the data. Well, the music industry is a little different from that. I mean, it's all over, all over the place and um, pieces here and some fantastic people out there that can tell you fantastic things, but you have to go get them. It's not, you know, you can't get it as easy. So however, the, the relatively low response in music would lead to questions about the credibility and reliability of the study if we were to rely on that only. So this called for some creativity. Um, we had to use, we had to become a creative um, ourselves to try and figure out how to do this. Um, and um, funny enough, you know, the idea came to me. One day I spoke to one of our artists, um, somebody who does some great work and I, and I like her music very well. And I said, look, could you tell us, uh, could, you, could you answer these questions for me and get some of your colleagues to answer the question? And she said, Noel, come on, man. Nobody now gonna answer that question here where you are there. And if them answer it, they're not gonna tell you anything that you want to hear. So don't bother waste your time. And like, I was just dejected. And but then she went on to say, but look, if you get a group of us together and sit down and talk with us, we can give you an idea as to how you can get the information and you don't have to say anything about anybody and nobody, nobody's business has to come into play. Um, and that's why sometimes it's easy, it's better to listen to the people in the business than to come with your own misunderstandings. Um, so having, um, heard that, we went back and started to think. And um, what we started to think about music is this. Well, one thing about musicians, they're all out there. They're all over the internet. If you want to know what a musician is doing, just type their name and everything will come up. All of their performances over the last year will come up. Um, so it's not a secret. It is out there. And boy, oh boy, we started to do that. Um, and boy, oh boy, we started finding information on, on male artists, female artists, bands, religious artists, it was all there. Um, in addition to that now, what is also out there if you ask the right people is how much does an artist earn typically for a gig? So, you know, you could pick artist A and, and you can call an A, book an A and say, how much would you charge for so-and-so to come and do a performance for me? And say, oh, well, you know, if it's, um, it's the Malaga or Sean Paul or any of those, you need to have $100,000, sir, um, you know, for a, for a gig. Or if it's um, some of the other guys in, in there, you need to have $10,000. Um, you know, I mean, I didn't, I, I can't imagine what Shensia would cost now, um, having seen her the other day out there um, um, performing and that kind of stuff. Um, but the thing is, working with the internet and working with people that know in the industry, we were actually able, ladies and gentlemen, to come up with a database of about 450 artists. Um, unfortunately, I can't share it with anybody because that's confidential only to me. And <laughs> um, um, But it's there with 450 artists that I can look at, you know, based on estimates of what they earn um, and get a notion then better than any sample could tell because now I'm not even, Miranda used the word census earlier. We're no longer using a sample, we are using a census because literally you can name the artist and we have an estimate, um, you know, that's based upon information of those who know the industry. So having said that, now you have an idea how we're gonna approach the music industry. So 
Um, but just, just to corroborate, just to, 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 to tighten how we approach this, as I said earlier, we have to finalize the number of income earning players in each of the industries. We categorize them into large, medium, and small, especially in the film and animation. We determined um, you know, um, the number of players in each category, how many were large, how many were medium, how many were small. And then we estimated um, the averages of key impact variables. And in this study, we basically did income because that was what we could get the information on. We, we, we might have to go back in another study, Rene, and look at employment and exports in more detail. But we got, the, we got an, 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 an idea of what they, they produce or earn and contribute to GDP. Then we had to measure the value of key impact variables for each category. So we had to measure the, the, the income. Then we had to apply multipliers because, okay, it's okay that you found, you know, how much income they're earning. But as I said earlier, that goes through the economy. So you need multipliers um, to take you through. Unfortunately, statin, in, in a lot of countries, your statistical institute or your planning institute do have those data and they used to. And what statin has promised us is that I think this year they should have their new input output tables, which you can use as multipliers. But, but because we don't have that, we had to you know, use assumptions. And using those, that's when we're able to measure the economic impact. So I will now go into um, the estimating the, the, the film. Um, just to say, our estimates show that the annual budget of companies in the film industries is about 26.6 million. That's the, the average annual, compared to 16 million for freelancers. And um, we used these estimates to come up with the estimates of what freelancers contributed or earned themselves about 175 75 million um, in, the, in the film industry. The companies um, that I told you about earlier earned about 1.3 billion, right? And this is, we found the number of companies, we found the average budgets, we multiplied them out and we blew it up to the population size came up to about 1.33 um, billion. Um, and for freelancers, we estimate that freelancers in film actually earn more than the companies because there are so many freelancers doing little pieces of this here, there all over the place. Um, and um, so they, they were the ones that really um, contributed a lot because when you put all their activities, I mean, 500 freelancers or however many there were against 50 companies, you can, you can understand um, what it was. But in, the important thing is in total, we estimate that they contribute 8 billion Jamaican dollars um, per year in the film industry, which is not trivial. If you give me $8 billion, now I can tell you I could do a whole lot of stuff. Um, so I'll move on to, so as I said, the population of practitioners we've estimated is that there are 50 companies, 500 freelancers. The total value of projects for companies, we estimate to be 1.3 billion, and for freelancers, 8.019 um, billion, and the overall contribution um, of film in terms of what the people in the industry themselves earn um, was 9.3 billion. But don't stop there, because these people in film spend money on equipment, they spend money on so other, every, every freelancer has somebody that works with him, um, somebody that has to drive do this, make food um, for them, directly for them. They, they spend money directly you know, on things in the industry. So this is what we call indirect contribution. And what we assumed, because we couldn't get the, the multipliers from Statian, is that these people, um, um, companies, filmmakers, freelancers and, and, and companies, spend 50% of what they earn on other equipment and other things in the industry. Now, some people say it's a lot more than that, but I didn't want to overstate it, um, but it's still substantial. And then we estimated that the induced expenditure, in, induced contribution is um, much greater. It's, it's like about 1.5 what they spend. And what am I saying there is that when people are making films, there, it's not just people in the industry that are involved. There are people that are making clothes, people that are doing the props, people that are you know, selling food. And the people that are involved are going out into communities. I mean, if a film is being shot in a community, 
then the community is having a good time during that thing. Everybody come out, the drinks, man, this, everybody comes out um, and is making some money. So it's not just the people in the film that are making money, it's the community. And this is what we have to always keep in our minds when we're stimulating this. If you want to estimate the true benefit, don't just look at what the people in the industry earn, which might be 9 million. Look at the economic impact, which is what they earn, plus the multipliers, plus the indirect benefits. So we estimate that for film to be 28 billion. Okay? Animated. So um, animation. So based on the typical budgets, um, which I spoke to you about earlier, for companies 10.9 and for freelancers 250,000. Um, the, the average annual budget of companies was, we, was estimated to be 211 million. There are some companies that do some serious animation work. And um, annual amount freelancers was 16. Um, I'm hoping that the people that were trained are getting in this industry and making some um, good money there. I mean, I know Jamaica's moving to a, a knowledge process outsourcing. Um, so this, these guys would fit right into that. Um, these estimates um, we used, the overall budget for companies in the animation industry was estimated to be approximately 846 million. So for companies, we estimate that their um, um, economic contribution based upon what they themselves earn is about 846 million. And the freelancers in, 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 in animation, about 175 million. Um, and as I said here, companies typically handle larger projects and greater volume of projects, while freelancers make an overall smaller contribution despite their relatively large number. Um, so it suggests though that the, the animation industry at the moment is dominated by a, by a few very large companies or relatively large companies. Um, but the freelancers work with these companies too. So here we go for the freelancers, even though I said to you that there are probably thousands of them out there. So as not to over expand our anal analysis, we, we and, and given our estimates of that, um, that we, we estimate that there are 20 companies in the instrument, in, in the industry, sorry, and we use 200 freelancers as operating. So we said the companies therefore earned 846 um, million and the freelance 175 to a total of over one, 1 billion. The indirect impact based on what they spend on other things in their industry, their equipment, their programs, their software, to 255 and their induced um, contribution by what goes outside. Um, you see the total comes to 510 and the total for the industry is about 1.8 billion. Um, music. Now, just to tell you, um, we estimated from our work that there are 269 male artists, um, 76 female artists, 54 gospel um, artists, 33 bands, 20 cabaret singers. And this is estimated because when I talk, talk to the cabaret singers, you know, they kept mentioning more and more, but this is what we, we found. Um, and the estimated total earnings of artists um, overall, and remember the main thing that these people in the industry they, um, earn from, you know, is actually live shows. You know, even though intellectual property is good, it's the live shows is where our performers in the artists really make their money um, in, in the modern day industry. So we had 154, um, and this is US by the way, US dollars, because, you know, people are booked up in US dollars. 154 million US dollars um, is what um, we estimated the, the male artist to earn. 16, well, just about 17 uh, million US dollars, the female artists. Um, and by the way, we found that 10% of the artists, 10% of the artists earn like 60% of the revenue in each case. So they, there's like 10% of our male artists are the ones that earn the lion's share. I mean, and I think if we cast our minds out there, we can start to, to imagine um, some of our bigger earners. Bands, we estimated earn um, about 5 million US dollars per year. And based, by the way, this is based on 2019 figures. Um, and group gospel artists earn about 9 million. It's, it's, that's not a bad market if you're, if you're thinking of going out there, you know. There's a good market out there. A lot of people like gospel music. 
So the estimated overall impact of performance artists in the music industry, when I convert it um, to Jamaican dollars, and multiply that by 145, the total of this, um, was a 57.65 billion um, Jamaican dollars. So let me move on to see what this really means now. So, Dr. Watson, I know we're going to be coming up to the um, Q&A session soon. I think we probably only have about 15 minutes left. Um, but I do know that the full report obviously goes into a lot of detail about how these how these figures are arrived. So I want to remind everyone um, who's watching that um, the the process and the, the the way that the estimations are arrived at um, is did undergo um, the rigorous process. So you're seeing the final output now, um, and all of that will be available in the report. But we do we will probably we're going to um, move into the Q and A shortly, so we might have to have to um, move quickly. Right. So I, I think we we basically got, um, got it, Renee. Um, is that you know I mean um, a lot of there is a lot of and I just want to say that um, while I move in there, an important impact, colleagues, like sound systems, the amount that they could contribute to our economy is incredible. Because what you have to remember when a sound system comes up, sets up, um, you know, people spend money to come to the function. They get the hair, they get the clothes, they get all the stuff. Um, so they, and they drink the drinks at the function. So there's money in the function, there's before the function and after the function. And those multiplier effects are significant. So you see, when we don't help the sound system industry find solutions, people, you know, we say, boy, it's not music, it's noise. Um, and, you know, we, are, we throw the risk of the, the noise abatement act at them. You, we don't realize how much money we're boxing out of people's um, mouths. Because I understand from speaking to them, you can have systems, Renee, where you can set them in a, in a center that where the music stays within the area. They don't need the stacks that are 15 feet high that you, know, that you can hear from Montego Bay when you're in Kingston. You, you can have those where you have the smaller, very powerful ones that you put around the stadium that keep the music and the sounds within so that you, know, you can still go out there and enjoy yourself. So we have to start looking at the technology that we can use so that these people can continue to operate. Um, okay, so let me just quickly finish up. Intellectual property is not trivial. Um, JCAP um, and JAMS collect IP. So according to the ESSJ, 156 million in royalties was collected for our artists. Now, a lot of this goes to relatively few. Um, and um, some of our artists are registered with overseas collective um, management organizations, other organizations collect for them. Um, so just let's say here, so approximately 40% of, of the 156 million um, dollars that's, that's collected stays in Jamaica and is paid out to Jamaican songwriters, composers. Um, this is equal to about 59 million after JCAP takes fees. The remaining 60% is sent overseas to, um, because what you must remember, our, our JCAP collects not only for Jamaican artists, it collects for foreign artists who um, are on our, in, who perform on our airwaves. So at the end of the day, they send 60% out. But what we have to note, what's interesting is 60%, a, a major percentage, 30% of the money that they send out goes to Jamaican artists who are registered with, with foreign um, um, intellectual property organizations. So that money comes back to Jamaica as well. So we're estimating that over 100 million um, would come back um, to Jamaica. And of course, when this money comes back in, it has its multiplier effects as well. So um, jams for the music society, they collect about 140 million. Um, and, um, it, and it's assumed that 100 million of this amount is collected um, accrues to Jamaicans, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, after telling you all of that, and as Renee said, the, 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 the details are there in this big report that we have here, um, which I can take you through. But out of all of that came those recommendations that I started with and which I end with. Let's get those reggae parts going. Let's start the dialogue. Let's, let's not tax our creatives. Let's do things to induce them to stay and invite other peoples to come. Let's encourage foreigners to come here and perform here so we, our guys don't always leave. Um, and let's reward creativity. 
So thank you all so very much. I guess we'll reserve everything else for the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Noel. And thank you, Denise and Miranda for your contribution and of course for everyone else on the A to Z team. Um, this was really very fascinating. A lot of information shared here today. Um, I also want to give a nod to some of the other economic impact reports and studies that have also been underway in the past couple of years. Um, and we did mention some of them. So there is also information that was um, reported on through the Ministry of Finance with the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Industry. Um, so that report is available. And the additional report that we mentioned as well was the CCI report, which was, um, which was conducted by the JBDC and the British Council. Um, and then of course we had um, some support from Nordicity as did the JBDC report as well. So there is a lot more information in the space at present than we have had for several years because up until now, we've all been referencing the Vanus James study from you know, 2005. <laughs> so, um, so we are getting there. There's definitely a need for greater, more, more consistent data collection as it relates to the economic um, impact of the creative sectors. Um, as we can see, these sectors are significant drivers for the economy, significant contributors to, to GDP, and also vastly underreported. So, uh, you know, we really do see that there is an, an increasing value for the practitioners and for policymakers and for all of our civil agencies and our MDAs, our ministries, departments and agencies and all of our stakeholders and practitioners out there to be more more involved in the process of data collection, data management, data reporting, and how we can use that to advance the creative economy and the impact that it has on the country. Because, you know, we look about with Talawa and this is really, the creative economy is, I, I say it all the time, it is the competitive advantage for this country. And it is the creative economy that is going to future-proof our country. So, so, you know, I think that this is um, really, really strong data and we are going to make the reports available. Um, just need to work with our marketing team to make sure that that gets that is made available. All right. I'm going to jump into the Q&A because we did. I know we had some lively discussion in the chat <laughs> all this time as well, but we do have some questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to jump in and see. We, we just have a few minutes, so I might not be able to get to all of them. Um, there was a question about the um, about the UK and starting a business. Now I realize that that's not directly related to what we are talking about today, but I think that that is um, that is it's important to so the context of that is the Cariforum EU Economic Partnership Agreement, and so this is one of the one of the trade agreements and one of the actual the vehicles that are in place that allow for greater mobility, greater access for trade and preferential trade um, between the CARIFORM countries and the EU. So I encourage you to go and look into that. Um, this is a way to, to mobilize and to access that export of services that we spoke about um, some time ago. Um, I, there was a, a question in here from Cordell as well, um, but I believe that we had answered your question, Cordell, in the chat, but the question was about um, how the process of reaching independent artists through their social media platforms or through ways um, beyond, the, uh, beyond the, the limited scope of responses, which, you know, as we all know, you know, we, we did talk about, and I thought it was really important for us to share the challenges that the, that the consulting team did face in identifying um, respondents because there is there is survey fatigue people are tired of that and there is a there is a, a risk aversion there's an aversion I shouldn't say risk aversion but there's an aversion towards contributing data towards these types of things so you know I, I think Noel aptly went into some of the other mechanisms that they um, that they had to utilize in order to bolster 
some of the data that was there. And again, the full report, this presentation is just extracting highlights, um, but the full report goes into a lot of detail. It's about 60 pages long, and it goes into a lot of detail around um, narrative detail and um, quantitative around how the information was gathered, because I think that is going to be really important. Um, we also had a question about qualified personnel to train artists and how to earn. Um, yes, it's it is an ongoing thing. Um, we do have we definitely have lots of persons who are local who are qualified in upskilling and training persons on monetization in the creative economy. But I think we also lean very heavily on our international partnerships and on the relationship building and the network that we have to make sure that there is balance in that and that not just in terms of training, but also that our ultimate product, our creative product and our creative service can stand up to a global demand and can stand up to the uh, standard of quality and an expectation of what we need to be able to deliver if we are truly going to be doing business globally. So, you know, that is a little bit of a, of a balance um, there. And uh, there was a question as well about the multiplier effect and taking it into account about developing incentives to attract foreign productions. Um, this is a this is an ongoing challenge. Um, we know that the incentive regime in terms of tax credits is not one that has, you know, there are there are challenges with, with adjusting it and changing it. So that's a little bit outside the scope of what we can discuss today. Um, but I think it is reports like this and, you know, consistently having this type of accurate data, which is going to drive and mobilize and galvanize the policy process into really taking this industry um, at the value that it is contributing. Um, so that is, uh, that's the questions that we have there. I see one just came in about the execution of the reggae parks. Um, so this is a recommendation. Um, it hasn't, it hasn't reached a point of, of execution. Um, so I wouldn't be able to speak to that today. Um, but it is a recommendation that has come out of the, out of the study. Um, and it actually does line up with a lot of recommendations that have come from previous studies, um, especially ones that are led by the Ministry of Culture because they have been calling for these special entertainment zones as well um, and additional venues for, um, for live performance. And, and of course, for recorded performance, which is a, a capital expenditure in building up that infrastructure. So uh, there are definitely a lot. I, I think a lot of what, the, what this report has demonstrated is very aligned, both um, quantitatively and qualitatively with um, studies that have, have come through in the past. Um, and we are definitely, we need to move towards execution and mobilization. Um, but I'm really, really thankful that we were able to get this study done. It happened in the middle of the pandemic <laughs> as well. So additional challenges there. Um, and, you know, we're now able to release some of the findings. So thank you, Dr. Watson, um, Denise, Miranda, and the rest of the A to Z team. We have a, a few minutes, a minute left, actually. So uh, if there are any questions, if there is a final question, I will take one more before we wrap. Um, let me just check if there's any additional questions. Oh, Kelly, I do see your question about um, publishing and literature. So this study was specific to the film animation and music sectors. Those are only the, se the sectors that were prioritized for this particular study. Um, so what, and I guess what I should really answer to that is that there is a need for a larger, more encompassing creative economy study. Um, we have had, um, business cases for this in the past and there was the um, the mapping that was done by the JBDC which did include um, the publishing and the literature um, sectors 
Um, but yes, absolutely. You know, we we can't we can't ever have enough data to validate and to quantify um, the the economic impact. And I see um, Shellyan from JVDC is um, noting in the comments that there is going to be a phase two for the for the mapping on the on the JVDC report. So looking forward to that and to thank you all. I imagine that some of the persons who are watching this presentation actually did contribute to the study so thank you for that um, and I'm happy to see that you have been able to join us today to see what the results of your contribution have been and um, thank you for not being too survey fatigued to respond to Dr. Watson's call for information. Um, Dr. Watson would you like to say a few final words? Um, yeah well just to say thank you and thanks um, my team, Miranda and Denise, thank Jamper so much for the opportunity to to allow me to, to fool around and fall in love with this um, this, uh, <laughs> this this in, this this sector or this industry. Um, and I want to thank all of those persons that helped us. Without without um, you know Jafter, I mean let me not even name them. Name you know all of those institutions. Um, thank you all so much. You really really did help us. Um, and I'm hoping that the next time around, um, you know, it will be even easier thing. So, so that's it. Just, just thanks. And we enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. All right. So everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, you may receive a note from Jampro with a thanks and giving you information about how to contact us if you have additional questions. And I look forward to, um, to engaging with you further. Thank you all for your time and your interest and your participation and have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care. <laughs>